Hi everyone and welcome to the Friday, August 6th installment of the Silicon Insider, the only uncensored look at life and business in the Valley. My name is Mike Malone and I'm here with special contributor Scott Budman of NBC Bay Area. Our producer is Jordan Henderson, our East Coast correspondent is Bob Grove, and our host as always is the Silicon Valley Business Journal. Okay, Scott, I gotta ask you about this first because <laughs> you're the talk of the town right now. A couple days ago, you did a story on the COVID Delta lockdown and the mask rule and all that. Right. You went to a, you went to a gym, but then the thing that got the most attention was you went to a bookstore. <laughs> now give me the setup for this and what happened. So there's this bookstore uh, on the Alameda, not far from University of Santa Clara. Recycle books. Right, recycle books. And those poor guys, you know, they're just running a bookstore and they just want to make sure that the, you know, intelligentsia of Silicon Valley has some good used books for themselves. And they were a victim of one of these anti-masking groups that walk in and film themselves yeah. <laughs> in an Last establishment time. without a mask. Yeah. yeah, kind of essentially. And, you know, you saw it in Whole Foods and sure. Trader Joe's, etc. So the video gets out, these poor guys. So we do the interview with them. And um, yeah, you know, it, it's funny. The only thing I ever get asked about for 25 years is technology until a couple of days ago. <laughs> I guess inadvertently we had done the interview and the um, you know the poor young guy who runs the store was up against a shelf of books of 1984. And I, you know, Orwell. So given the subject matter, and again, how a lot of these anti-maskers invoke George Orwell's 1984. Right. Did we do that on purpose? And no, of course we didn't, but uh, there were a lot of books all over the place. But ever since then, everyone's noticed, oh, you had to invoke 1984 in the story. Well, apparently it's a meme that's gone everywhere. And the, 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 but the after story is, if the guy had been a little bit taller you were interviewing, <laughs> it would have been Das Kapital by Karl Marx, right? Well, when, when someone turned to me and said, hey, how did you put him uh, you know, by 1984, I, which I didn't, I tried to think fast. I looked up a little taller and said, hey, if Ryan was a little taller, we would have had marks. And, uh, you know, I, I don't even know what that means. But Well, it's spreading around the country. Well, there you go. Now, you had another great story this week. I mean, this has been a very interesting. I mean, it's been kind of a week, week after all these big weeks of news and we couldn't believe how many major stories were happening right. in the middle of the summer. This has been kind of a potpourri, kind of low-level week. But you tested the, the electric Ford F-150. And I thought of you. I know you're a truck guy. You're I have a Ford F-150. Right. Yeah. And I'm a big proponent of, of EVs and, and all that. And uh, so, yeah, it's good that you and I are here to, to talk about this. But, yeah, so the first time the F-150 uh, comes to California is Thursday. They bring it. Ford actually has sort of a skunk works in Palo Alto. A lot of the companies do. Well, I knew Volkswagen, that, but I, I didn't know Ford was they here. They do. They opened it some years ago. And it's been great for us tech reporters because whenever there is any sort of an EV or whatever, right. you know, a lot of these uh, Microsoft or Apple inside the cars, they'll show it off there. And so they brought the, uh, what do they call it, the F-150 um, Lightning, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so we got to, to check it out. And Wait, the Lightning I think is that's electric? what they call it. The F-150. Because that's their high performance Probably well, is. Probably they have is. they have several versions even of the EV. The basic one starts yeah. at forty thousand dollars. The loaded one, eighty nine k. Yeah, for that a truck. sounds like a lightning. Yeah. It's a lot, and you it's know, probably you, a thousand horsepower too. It, it's it, it's funny. That's one of the things that that I asked them about because I know truck owners, and I'm I'm trying to channel you know your <laughs> thoughts and complaints through the years. You know, truck owners want more than just a typical sedan. You need torque, you need pulling, towing power, all that stuff. And this one has, I mean, it's loaded. It's got a lot of room. The back seat is comfortable and roomy. The wow. front seat feels like you're in an EV because it's comfy. You've got a giant iPad-like screen, just really? like a Tesla. Yeah. And, um, and of course, the gauges aren't just what you usually see because you've got to keep track of the battery and all that. Yeah. And um, anyway, other than that, which are you know changes in the modern world, what impresses me about the 150 is that they kept it a 150. It looks like the regular truck. It's not the Toyota polygonal tank. Well, the you I know mean, the, the Tesla the, the Tesla Cybertruck, yeah, yeah. The you know, cyber the Cybertruck truck looks like something out of a video game. Yeah, and it's for you know you're going to buy it if you're willing to drive around in that. The F-150 has been for decades the best-selling vehicle in America. In America. Why would you mess with that? Right. You make it electric. You say, hey, we're keeping everything that you've all loved, but now you're going to pollute less. And that should be an incentive. And, and you don't have to change what you've always loved about the F-150. So you can see 
a cowboy with a 30-30 rifle in the back, <laughs> yeah, smoking a smoking a Marlboro, climbing out of his electric F-150. I Why? mean, it, it has that look about it, right? I mean, it's not going to scare off people in Enid, Oklahoma. No, the Cybertruck might. Yeah, well, of course it will. Scares Why? me. Why should that cowboy pollute the environment? Yeah. Right? Come on. If we learn nothing from the saga of the Marlboro Man. Right. Right? right. Less uh, pollutants are better. And, and really, this is a truck that is powerful. Um, you know, we don't yet even know how it's going to go head to head against a lot of the other ones, but we do know they're coming. Tesla's got a truck. Rivian is making nothing but trucks. Right. Um, and we're going to see others, and I think that's terrific. What's the uh, mileage on? They they sure. haven't released it officially, but they say initially for the basic model it looks to be about 300. Not all that much, to be honest, but. Because it's one thing to have. Yeah, but if you have a farm or a ranch, you're not going to be driving 300 miles. I mean, if you're living in Montana and you're commuting between cities or something like that, yeah, you need more than 300. But I would think that's a practical distance. Probably. I think one thing we're going to have to check out with the trucks is the whole fleet angle. Because that's where a lot of yeah. difference will be made, you know, cut down on a lot of pollutants. Sure. But will it be enough to handle a city or a county or a state fleet? of trucks and um, that's something that, you know, that's kind of Ford's bread and butter. In addition yeah. to selling to people like you, they want to get their trucks and fleets. Yeah, well, what if King Ranch buys 50 of them, you know, all of a sudden the rules change. Right, I mean, we're starting to see police departments here in Silicon Valley go with Teslas, why not? Yeah, that's an interesting sight when I see yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so the big story of the week, obviously, is we're back in masks. Yes. Right. We have a new regulation that all through the Bay Area and most of the companies around here, you bet masks are required again. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm of two minds because everything I've seen about masks says they don't really work that well, you know, because viruses are really small. On the other hand, it keeps you from transmitting, you know, saliva through the air. So. I don't know. Uh, and kids, kids are going to have to wear masks again in school, which surprised me given what we've learned in the intervening months about young kids. But at the same time... It protects the teachers. Yeah, but also it protects themselves. I mean, one thing that I didn't expect having kids in school um, is uh, for 17 months, we had not so much as a cold in the house. Yes. So the... I, and, and, you know, that was... Yeah. Obviously, because we were scared of something much bigger, but wow, nobody got sick. No school days were missed. So the idea of going back to school, I'm glad about. Back to school in masks? Hmm, maybe there'll be less school days missed. <laughs> That's not bad. I'm for that. Yeah, I like the idea of back to school. It, this has yeah. been so hard on kids. Um, interestingly, one company is not, fa it, most companies around here are also mandating vaccines. Right. I mean, Apple and Google and all the rest of you got to have vaccines to walk through that, that lobby. Except one. One big one. Intel. I knew you were going to say Intel. It's actually two big ones. Oh, yeah? Intel is the surprise because although it's big, it's not uh, Amazon. Amazon yeah. is also not mandating it, but you understand Amazon A doesn't treat its workers no, well. No, I was going to say, that's kind of of a piece <laughs> right. with has Amazon. Right, has huge turnover, has all these warehouse workers that are yeah. under terrible conditions. So, okay, I, you know, like you say, it's almost expected. Intel is unexpected only because, you know, you've got Netflix, you've got Google, you've got Facebook, all these other companies that are mandating it. Why not Intel? I, that I don't understand. This is a company famous for wearing, you know, bunny suits uh, yes. to protect the chips. Yeah. Why can't you protect your co Got to protect those chips. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was. I saw something on the news today that looking at the impact on companies around the country, and you know, just as they were starting to let up and let people back to come back to work, there's a lot of companies that are not going to open until next year. All around the United States, from banking places in New York to tech companies to everything else. You know, that will be going on three years of not going to the office. Now, jobs in this town typically don't last three years. I mean, you see most people's resumes. They got two years somewhere and they've jumped somewhere else. This has been your new job for the last three years is working out of your house. Yeah, you got a badge for some company that you never visit. I mean, I'm interested in the cultural impact of this. I mean, people will have really assimilated 
life at home, settling in the home office, getting you know the right equipment for Zoom calls and all that. Are they going to go back? Some will and some won't. You know, I've I've heard a lot of these stories where, hey, we're bringing you back to work. Oh, I probably should have mentioned I moved to Chicago. You know, <laughs> yeah, or things yeah. like that. But also um, the idea that people have gotten jobs during the pandemic and just have not set foot in the office. They've never been there. Right, like college freshmen, many haven't set foot on their campus. Um, and nor have they met their coworkers face to face, only yes. over Zoom. And so you're right, a three year cycle in the tech industry is often one where a job changes. And so maybe you will actually have a full job, a couple of years, maybe even vest some equity never, without ever setting foot in the office. I've never actually held the handles of the lobby door. <laughs> right, and yet at the same time, as we now know, it works. These yes. companies are still doing well. Indeed. And and I agree with you know the, the Tim Cooks of the world that, that something is missing unless you're face to face. Yeah. But um, I, I don't know how but long we develop workarounds for that. Right. You know, um, we're and, not and swapping I, pheromones, but we're picking up other cues, looking at our our monitor on those Zoom calls. Yeah, and uh, I don't know how long it lasts because we, even a few weeks ago, we were talking about how, well, they're coming back to the yeah, office we're... and things are, and then the Delta hits, and now we are, I think, poised to take a pretty big step backwards. Yeah, oh, I think so. And, and there are variants, other variants are waiting in the wings out there, they say. Right. I think the orgy of home rebuilding that's been going on around here is partly due to people going crazy in their houses. I, I just can't take having that window there anymore. But I also think it's, they are prepping themselves for a new world, that, that they're making their homes into castles where you work and play and sleep at night, that, you, that they're accepting this for new reality and they're adapting to it and they're changing their homes to do so. Well, right, but a lot of people are in apartments with other people. You can't change your home. No, then you know. Yeah, they're screwed. Well, but, uh, you know, what do you do um, in that situation? And I think that's why some people are leaving the Bay Area, because the idea of a home is still yes. so far out of reach. And that's something that these tech companies are going to have to deal with, because the housing problem that snuck up on them years before the pandemic yes. is now on steroids because of the pandemic. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going... If I'm going to have to work from home, it's going to be a real home. It's going to be a house. You know, it's not going to be four walls with neighbors on in each direction. Yeah. Right. And when this was a, hey, let's stay home for six weeks. Okay, whatever. Maybe yeah. a year. Hmm. But like you say, if we're going on two years and even three years, um, at some point, right, something's got to give. And yeah. maybe people leave the area because of that. Okay. We did have some earnings this week, right? Yes. And they showed uh, the, um, the pandemic giveth and <laughs> taketh away. I liked your line on that. Uh, Etsy, you would have thought, well, I guess Etsy's coming, thought it was coming, we we're coming out of it, so you didn't have to buy stuff on Etsy anymore. You could actually go to a store, but I'm surprised that uh, it's, an, it's had a little trouble. Well, but I, I'm not, only because it rose so high, and this is what we saw the week yeah. prior with Amazon. I mean, look, no one's saying Amazon is a, you know, a lousy stock or anything. I mean, the valuation it hit, you know, it's a trillion dollar company. Etsy as a smaller version of that, but the stock price soared. Yeah. And then it said in the forecast, looking ahead, we expect a little less online shopping. Now, again, if Delta yeah. variant really kicks in and we have to hunker down again, maybe not. But the okay. forecast is that e-commerce slows a bit, which hurts some of these companies. And I just found it interesting that you can look to the market to see um, sort of the, the overall spending habits. You know, obviously yes. you saw growth in Zoom and Moderna and Amazon and Netflix, you know, and now you're starting to see a little bit of a pullback in these forecasts because, well, we, we actually assume people are going to leave their home and maybe go to a movie theater or shop in a mall or something yeah, like well, that. What's interesting has been a direct correlation almost in real time. Yeah. You know, usually if there's a lag on this stuff, no, boom. Um, Roku down. Now, I can honestly say I probably would have not survived the last 18 months without Roku. And a lot of people would echo that. And yet their forecast is for less streaming. And that's almost hard to believe because we've become such streamers, right. pandemic or no. But um, I don't know. I, for one... I think I some fraction of the population is never going back to a movie theater. Well, that's the thing. I was going to say I haven't gone back yet, but I'm a huge fan of movie theaters and live concerts for the same reason. I sure. love that communal experience and I miss it very, I miss them both very much. But, um, you know, I think Roku is looking ahead and saying, boy, there are enough people. I mean, look at, I don't know if you saw 
pictures from Lollapalooza in Chicago. Yes, 200,000 people. Apparently a lot of people wanted to get out and you know yeah. commune amongst themselves. And uh, so that shows that appetite for putting down the remote control and getting out and doing something in real life. And I get it. Yeah. Um, don't know that I'm ready for Lollapalooza yet, but, uh, but I get that they want to stream less and experience life more. It's the nature of human beings. Okay, uh, Uber drops. Interestingly, not because they don't think people are going to use it, but because they can't get any drivers to come back. Yeah, this is that that uh, the economic, and we also late this week got the jobless numbers, you know, and people are still not seeing people coming back to work as fast as they were. I'm not sure if I said that right, but there are still a lot of jobs open that are going unfilled. Uber is saying we have to pay more money to convince drivers to come back, and that's hurting our so bottom revenues line. may not fall, but the bottom line might. Right, because, because well, and, and you're seeing a lot of the small businesses, bars and restaurants have to pay now above minimum wage to convince people to come back. And that'll last at least a little while longer, yeah. but eventually the stimulus money, the extra unemployment money will run out. But for now, um, you know, it'll, it'll, we're still not at equilibrium. Right. And you can sense we're kind of fl flinging back and forth trying to find that mean. Um, you know, I was going to call this section the changing of the guard because we, I thought we had a perfect model here. Pinterest shares closed down more than 18% after the company reveals a decline in users. So the life cycle of Pinterest is basically over and it's falling down now. Well, I don't know if it's over, but they too were really benefited by people staying at home. Yeah. And um, sort of, if you weren't already on Pinterest, kind of discovering Pinterest because you had all this time online. Yeah, but it does the company, I don't know if, to you, but to me, it seems like it's an old company now. It's, right. not, it's not hot anymore. Okay, and I thought, well, what's hot? And I thought, Robin Hood. <laughs> yes. Okay, I mean, it uh, goes public, and then it surges more than 24%. It goes past its own IPO price this quick. I mean, we were talking about Robin Hood last week, and how many companies go public, and then the usual thing is the institutional investors take the cream off the top, then they bail, and then us poor suckers out there pick up the stock and write it down, you know, to the bottom, and then the institutions come back in and take another profit. But Robinhood, man, it went, it went twenty, it went a quarter of, you know, twenty-five percent past its thirty-eight dollar IPO price within a week. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Okay, so I was going to use that as an example of a hot company coming up as Pinterest is going. <laughs> And literally, as I was typing it, uh, shareholders announced that they were going to do a $100 million share sale, and Robinhood stock tanks, <laughs> tanks right before my eyes. Yeah, I mean, anyone who thought that Robinhood was going to come out and be a stable stock was not doing anyone Anybody who work. thought those 28-year-olds in basements were going to be loyal to Robinhood. Exactly, and that's yeah. exactly why. And Robinhood comes out lower than the IPO price. All right, well, it's taking on Wall Street. Maybe Wall Street wasn't thrilled. Within a couple of days, it had doubled, and then it fell back 20 bucks from 70 to 50, and this is all in its first week of trading because it's Robinhood. I mean, Robinhood created the meme stock. It became a meme stock, and I still think we're nowhere near, either up or down, figuring out where this stock trades. And if you're willing to jump into that kind of a blender, Good luck. Good luck. You've got to have some... We've warned them enough. We're done warning them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to mention three terms that I encountered this week, which are not going to happen overnight, but there's there's something going on in all three of them that may literally change everything down the line. They may turn, they may sputter into nothing, but they may be transformative of all of our of human society. Uh, one of them is super intelligence. Okay. That's, that's beginning to come up. We know about AI. You know, we've been watching AI for years. We've been watching those robot dogs jumping around at wherever it is, MIT. But now they're talking about AI intelligence going into physical objects, not just sitting out there in the cyberspace, but actually controlling things. And as that happens, it, there many people, important people, are predicting that more and more machines are actually going to start making critical decisions instead of letting hu messy human beings do it because they'll be able to bring so much to the party. And they're saying this could have a profound effect 
It could literally happen overnight, a couple breakthroughs in the algorithms. And in, you know, in two or three years, we may suddenly see super intelligence, machine intelligence popping up everywhere. Uh, and that's part of a thing called Im embedded AI. And that leads to a thing called the multiverse. And, and uh, I don't know if you, have you heard that term yet? Yeah, I mean, it's been banding around. It. Yeah, the Facebook yeah. talked about it on their earnings call. Microsoft yeah, talked about been it. Yeah. talking about it. It's the idea of right now we have the natural world and we have the cyber world. And we're moving back and forth between them. Kids are spending half their time on each one now. By the way, we all first heard the term uh, metaverse, like metaverse. so many terms. I, I got in, the wrong word. Neil See, I haven't even learned a word yet. Metaverse. Wait, what did you say? Did I? Say I think wrong? I said multiverse. Metaverse. I think metaverse, which comes from as so many cyber terms. Neil Stevenson books. Snow Neil Crash. Stevenson's books. No crash. Yeah, and anyway, which so was kind of give a, him some credit. Kind of a parody, kind of a comedy. I mean, and yet one that turned out to be yes. Very so familiar. the metaverse is the idea that these two worlds, these two universes, are beginning to merge together, so that we will. You know, walking along with our special glasses on and, you know, seeing the physical world and the cyber world on top of each other, that it's it's going to become seamless. And that, who's, who knows? But I mean, if you read Ready Player One, you know that it's not exactly seamless. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. there are flaws in all this stuff. Yeah. And of course, I just wrote a book a year ago with, with Bill David out warning about the dangers of this metaverse. Right. And then finally, there is a... Uh, it's, it's a crystal clock, a clock crystal. Have you heard about this? That Google's working on this? That one of the problems is in managing um, uh, the next generation of computers, that it's, it's hard to control things that are moving in and out of, you know, um, quantum, you know, the quantum universe back and forth. And the idea that these, sub Intel, I mean, Google says it's onto something. They're not talking about it in depth, but it may be a way to actually control the clock of a quantum computer. And if that happens, they suddenly go from being, you know, a great idea to being something physical and real. Look, you know what I cover for a living. I'm, I'm talking about an EV here, a stock yeah. there. I'm not going to be covering the changes in the quantum clock. I, we're a, we're not there yet. You may take your Social Security check though and buy <laughs> one of these things uh, one of these days. No, I'm always interested in listening. You know, groundswells where you hear an idea starting to emerge. It goes. It, everyone talks about it. Then it goes away for ten years, and then suddenly it bursts on the scene. And everybody goes, where did that come from? 99% uh, of the time it doesn't, but every once in a while they do. And I'm just letting everybody know to keep an eye out for those terms and watch what happens over the next few years. Okay, uh, Zoom. Uh, Zoom had to pay $85 million uh, and bolster its security practices uh, because of a shareholder suit claiming that privacy rights, uh, user privacy rights were interfered with Partly because Zoom wasn't telling everybody they were selling their data to other people, and partly because of the photo bombing going on that we all remember well, which is no longer a fad. Right. I mean, the Zoom bombing, I, I you know, Zoom needed better security, but I don't think that's ultimately what they're paying for. I think they're paying for the, the privacy violations. Yeah. And they had yeah. to fess up to that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a couple quick things. Uh, apparently, Apple's uh, privacy changes have not had that much of an effect yet. Everyone's saying, oh, it's going to be a nightmare for, you know, Facebook and Snap and all that, but it hasn't been. Uh, the United Kingdom is considering blocking a takeover of Arm Limited by NVIDIA. That's the first potential setback NVIDIA's had in a long time. I and mean, they've been a juggernaut. You know, they've been an unstoppable force. What do you think? Well, a $40 billion dollar deal. Right, and that's why that it got the UK eyes. The eyes haven't been on NVIDIA because everything they've done has been hyper successful, but on a small level. The UK always gets in the way of big deals like this because they are anti-monopolistic. And anti-American. I mean, let's call it straight. <laughs> American, American capitalism. Believe me, I've spent so much time in England. Right. I, that's all you hear. You know, we're going to stop that Google. You know, we're going to stop whatever. Right, and the history, the history of the tech industry is growth in America and the British trying to stop that growth. Yeah, exactly. And I get it. It's what they do. And uh, finally, uh, did you know Google's making its own chips now, smartphone chips? I saw. I saw, yeah. 
And uh, one question is, uh, what's it going to do to Qualcomm? Now, has the stock moved because of that announcement? Not yet, but you know, it's interesting. It made me think again of Intel. You know, Intel missing out on the smartphone revolution. Yes. Not only emboldened Qualcomm to sky high. But strategy. everybody. Yeah. yeah. And so now, you know, and Apple The king is, is dead. Who's, you know, Apple in their last couple of, of their events have talked up their own chips. Uh, obviously, Qualcomm is still number one. NVIDIA has doubled Intel's market cap. And now you've got Google saying it's going to make its own smartphone chips. All of this, I think, starts from Intel dropping the ball. And yeah. uh, now it's fascinating. I, you know, in a time of a chip shortage, um, I guess that opens the door for companies that don't normally build chips to start doing it and say, hey, we're going to do this ourselves because the global market is still so slow. Well, maybe Intel's plan going all the way back, going full circle to the beginning of this, maybe Intel's plan is to recruit all those anti-maskers <laughs> to work on their chips, stealing them from all the other companies. Uh, I should mention, as long as we're talking about Google, founders Sergey Brin and uh, Larry Page have, since May, have sold $1 billion in Google stock. Now, Bob Grove said that to me with the question, beer money? Uh, <laughs> which is kind of true for those guys, given their wealth. But what if it's a new project they're working on? You know? I don't know. I mean... Or is it, or is it some, something they know about Google we don't? It could be anything, but also it's just, I mean, think about Google's valuation over the last decade. They are so wealthy yes. and also getting to the point where they're not really day to day as much. Yeah. You know, a billion dollars pin money, well, beer money, like, I mean, like Bob said. Huh. You get to a certain point where, um, you know, what is it, the mandatory distribution of like social security and not to say they're that old, but at some point you got to take some of this money off the table because there's so much of it. And I don't know if they just want to diversify a little bit or you know, like Jeff Bezos get into the space program or whatever they're going to do next. I am fascinated with what billionaires do next. Yes. Um, and we haven't really seen what Sergey and Larry are going to do next. But I think we may be on the cusp of that. Google has good leadership. It's part of now the whole alphabet umbrella. Sergey and Larry haven't been in the news in a long time for anything Google related. Maybe we're going to see what comes next. And it could be billions of dollars worth of investments in either new technologies or uh, philanthropy or something like that. Good point. Um, yeah, it'll be very interesting to see. Sure. Charity or some goofball and le venture that, <laughs> you know, like rocket ships with you and your brother. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's it for now, folks. You can find us on the Silicon Valley Business Journal homepage as well as on Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.